Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome back to East 280. I heard there was a 203 exam tonight. So are you guys the ones that are well prepared for the exam? And that's why you're here? And everybody else are the ones that are like, uh, got up this morning and thought, uh, maybe I should start studying. All right, because you are here, I'm going to give you some tips and tricks or uh, some extra hints for project three. I want to explain a little bit more about operator overloading uh, and how it works and why it works. So we're going to start off with a little live coding. We're also going to see if I can actually make things compile in front of an audience. <laughs> right? So you can see in my home directory we have card.h and nothing else. So we're going to start uh, card.cpp, and we're going to pound include card.h. And I'm going to inf include IO stream just because we're going to do a, some examples. Uh, let's see. We want to implement, we'll start with this one. So I'm going to, I'm showing you how I actually code, OK? This is what I actually do. I go into my h file. I copy paste what I want to work on. I paste it, and I start my implementation. And then I just do something dumb like, hi, I'm operate, operator less than, backslash n. And then we'll assert 0. But that won't compile unless we pound include c assert. And those should go first. OK. Yeah, once you learn how to use a text editor, this is no big deal. Uh, then we're going to compile it with standard C++11, card CPP. Uh-oh, C out. Oh, yeah, I did mean standard C out. Thanks. So there's that. Undefined symbols. Uh-oh. What is an undefined symbol? No main. All right. What would be the best way to do this? Have another file? Should I? Here, what's wrong with this? It's in card CPP. See this up here? We're in card CPP. Uh, let me do this. Text scale increase. So this is card.cpp. So we shouldn't do that. So we'll, we'll open another card test.cpp. And then we'll uh, pound include card.h. And now we can put a main in here, IO stream. And now we can do standard C out, hello from card test. And then we can compile it, and we have to add card test to the command line. You with me? What? Duplicate symbol main? Oh, because I forgot to save it when I did that example of don't do this. Oops. So you're watching me make all the dumb mistakes. And there's hello from card test. All right, now let's make it more interesting. Let's actually, now I'm in uh, card CPP. Let's implement the less than operator. Oh wait, let's use the less than operator. How about that? So we'll make uh, card A, card B, and then if A is less than B, a is less than B. And now we'll try to compile that. Oh, crap. C out again. All right, there we go. Uh-oh. Symbol not found. Wait, what's going on with this? It can't find, what function can it find? The constructor. And let's look at my card CPP. Why is that? Because there is no constructor. All right, let's implement it. What do you want the constructor to do? How about nothing? I'm the constructor. This is seriously how I start coding. I don't worry about the logic. Just get it to compile and then add the logic in. So I'm the constructor. I'm the constructor. Hi, I'm an operator less than. And then the assertion fails. Ah, oh, that's because I forgot to implement this. Oops. That should do it. Um, hey, we can do this all in one line. A is less than B. All right, now let me show you what's going on. 
we wrote this function called operator less than, and then when we went over to card test and we did this, this line of code is causing the operator less than function to run. So really, it's a normal function with a funny name. The funny name is operator less than. So here's another way to do it. Operator less than a comma b. Will this compile and run? Yep, a is less than b. Hi, I'm operator less than, which is coming from this line of code here. So operator less than is a normal function. You call operator less than with either this weird syntax that nobody uses or this syntax that everybody uses. So that's the point. Operator less than is a normal function. Optionally, you can call it with this funny syntax that's quite natural for many of us. Can I answer any questions? Yes. So let me rephrase your question a little bit. When I code operator less than, should I just return true? No. You should actually put logic in here to figure out which card is more valuable, or which card is less valuable. The question was when we're doing operator overloading and we're writing the name of the function, which I've highlighted here, do you always type operator and then a symbol and then some brackets? Yes. This is how C++ describes the function. Uh, you call it operator overloading. Does that mean there's like a default? Overloading? Operator overloading. Does that mean there's like a default? Yeah, it works with integers. And now what we're saying is, you can use the less than symbol in a new and different way if it's a card. Just for cards, though. Does that mean that when you call an operator less than function, whenever you use the operator, if the operator is any other context, it can do whatever you tell the function to do? Or can you also compute the compare integers? Or? The question was could we use our brand new code to compare integers? To answer your question, I'm going to do it by inspecting my code. Are you with me that this is a function and that this function has two inputs? Let's inspect the inputs and see if the types match. If I put an integer into this function, would it compile? No. So there's another implementation of operator less for integer somewhere else. So does the compiler know which one to use? So does the compiler know which one to use? Yep. How does it know? Because it can tell what the input types are. And so it picks the right one by looking at the input types. So the overloading for the abstraction one, the output screen, or the different function, there's an ampersand between close screen and operator. What is the role of that ampersand? So you were asking about uh, this guy right here. Yes? So the question is, why is there an ampersand right here? Oh, why is there an ampersand here? All right, this ampersand has nothing to do with this function name. Are you with me that the name of the function is highlighted? And are you with me that the inputs are highlighted? And so what's left? It's not the name of the function. Not the inputs to the function, what's left? The return type. The return type is a reference. It's really easy to mix up and think that that ampersand means something to the function name. It has nothing to do with the function name. It has everything to do with the type that the function returns as its output. So remember in the past how we returned values from functions? Cool, we've been doing that for years. Remember how we've returned pointers from functions? Yes. We can also return references from functions. Do overloaded operators apply to subclasses? Do overloaded operators apply to subclasses? The short answer is no. The long answer is operator overloading and inheritance gets just super nasty. 
So Bjarne just says, don't do it. All right. Can I get into new topics today? You just want me to code? <laughs> you know, I don't think I've ever done an entire X280 of live coding. That would be kind of fun. But it also might get boring because, you know, you kind of watch somebody fix compiler errors and stuff. Yes? Can you put any data types that you wanted in the uh, parameters? Like, could you put a card in the int or any data types you want? Did I have to You're talking about overloading the output operator. Uh, the less than operator. Or so you're talking about overloading any operator. Right. The question is, could you do anything? Could these types here be any type that you want? Yep. And that's why it's called overloading. Do they, have to match? do they have to match? All right, the dirty secret is no. If you want to compare a card to a whatever, you could write a function that would do that. It's not that common, but here's an example where it's done. C++ strings and C strings. Why can you like mix them together? Because of the question you just asked. You can have an input type where one of them is a C++ string, one of them is a C string and it will do that function. That's how you can compare the two. So it's not magic, it's code. One more question and then we'll start lecture. Are there any operators where you can't overload it no matter the case? Are there any operators that you are not allowed to overload no matter what? Oh, I like this question. This is an interesting question. I didn't know the answer to this until a couple years ago when somebody was like, Asked the same question, and I had to like, uh, we got to go ask Bjarne. So I looked it up. There are three, and the answers make a great deal of sense. Which ones do you think they are? You have learned all of them, and I can't remember them. <laughs> See that one, and that one. Colon colon, the scope resolution operator. You cannot overload it. Semicolon is a great candidate because C++ would go nuts, <laughs> but it's not an operator. You can overload assignment. Uh, new, I, I believe you can overload. Actually, I don't know the answer to that, but it's not one of the three. I can tell you this. It is not one of the three. You can overload the or and and operators. It's a great deal of fun. <laughs> Return is not an operator. It's a keyword. It's not an operator. Uh, I think that's the case with new as well. New is a keyword, but not an operator. You've used this a bunch of times. Dereference address of. We will do that in this class. <laughs> not today, but in this class. The dot operator. You cannot overload the dot operator, or classes would be like, whoa, how do I get inside me? And <laughs> like, how would you access the members, right? You couldn't if there was the dot. I shouldn't have said it that way. Um, <laughs> and the third one, I cannot remember right now. Try Googling that. What, what C++ operators can't I overload? Can you overload the arrow? Yes. But you can't overload the dot that's inside of it. Yes? The conditional operator, the ternary operator, like the question mark? Yeah. Oh, you can't overload the question mark. Oh, OK. Thank you. All right. So you can't overload the dot. You can't overload the scope resolution. You can't overload the ternary operator. Uh, do you know the ternary operator? So this would be like uh, return a is greater than, or let's see, return LHS greater than RHS, question mark, true, else, false. That's the ternary operator. It's, an if, it's the same thing as if LHS is greater than RHS, return true, else, return false. Why don't we learn this earlier? Why didn't you learn this earlier? Yeah. You're supposed to learn this in your 100 level class. Why is that needed? Because C programmers like to be cute. <laughs> if you want to do it on one line, that's how you do it. Does it not work if you put the semicolon after RHS? Does it not work if you put the semicolon? Just like that's how you do it. It's the same thing. 
All right, let's stop having fun and start learning about container ADTs. OK. So we talked about data abstraction, which lets us separate what a type is from how the type is implemented. And we used classes to do this. They let us model complex things and make programs easier to maintain and modify. That's all still true. We're going to use these concepts today in a different way than we did before. It's, ADTs give us information, hiding, and encapsulation. Two things we're going to take advantage of again today. We're going to protect and hide our code from other programmers or other code that uses our code. And we're going to keep the data and the functions that belong with that data together. Containers. You've seen something that's a lot like a container that's built into C++, C++ arrays. Arrays help us glue together several objects that have the same type. But that, that's nice. What if we want a container that has more features? Uh, so here's an example. Let's, have a, let's make a set today. A set like in a mathematical sense, that it's zero more integers with no duplicates. Are you with me that an array might have duplicates or it might not and it doesn't care? That's great sometimes. Sometimes when you're writing code, you want a set where there's no duplicates. So let's write one. We're going to make an abstraction. So what should our set do? We should be able to insert something into the set. We should be able to remove something from the set. Ask if the number is in the set and count how big the set is. Makes sense that these are the small number of operations that would be really useful with a set. Can you think of other stuff you might do with a set? Set union, set intersection, set difference, subsets. We're not going to do any of that. We're just going to do these today. So here's my set. I'll put the public parts first. We need a constructor to create a set. And then I have one, two, three, four member functions, one for each of the English descriptions on the previous slide. So insert will take a new integer and add it to the set. Remove will take a new integer, find it in the set, and take it out. Query will say, hey, is this integer in the set? Oh, what does this mean? There's lots of different places we can put const in our code. This const is at the end of a member function. Yes, please. Yeah. It promises that it won't modify any member data. So different kinds of consts. These two member functions promise, oh, I won't modify any member data. Do we have member data yet? Not yet, but we will. So we should add comments because we're making a proper abstract data type here. Uh, comments, same RMEs that we learned about in January. These apply to the member functions. And they help the other programmer who's reading about our set, who's going to use our set, know what the functions do without worrying about how the functions work. So returns true if V is in the set. Size, returns the size of the set. We need a representation for our set. Um, we got to pick what member variables we want, and then we got to implement all of the member functions. So that's what we're going to do next. Before I do that, can I answer any questions? Are RMEs standard practice? Uh, having a comment next to all of your function declarations, in other words, function prototypes, comment with a function prototype, standard practice. Some people just put a damn comment on it. Some people use an RME, and some people use preconditions and postconditions. Preconditions and postconditions are a fancier mathematical way of saying RME. Yeah.
does adding const give us any advantage? It does two things. One, it tells the other programmer that this function won't modify your set. And two, it helps us while we're writing the implementation. It helps us avoid any mistakes. The question was, are arrays, are, are, are vectors in the C++ standard library implemented in the way that I'm describing? Yes. It's not that special. It's a class. So here's, let, let me show you how vectors written. Blah, blah, blah. And then there's a default constructor. And then there's a function called push back. It's using the same parts of C++ that you already know how to use. You just didn't have to write the source code. How do you write classes that take those angle brackets? How do you write classes that take those angle bracket stuff? By the end of today's lecture, you will know. All right. We don't have a representation, but the other programmer knows what this set does. So let's pick a representation. We're going to use an array, and we need to describe what we're going to do with this array. Uh, a set of size n is going to be an unordered array of integers with no duplicates in the first n slots of the array. So we're going to have this big array, and the, the set 1, 2, 3 would be stored like, it could be stored like this. And size, else size is 3. Else size tells us to ignore some of the boxes. So that's, we'll use examples like this throughout the lecture. The size tells us, use the first few boxes of the array and ignore the other boxes. This is similar to what you did in P2 when you made a matrix or an image with a really big size and then you used part of it and you ignored part of it. Same trick. Why are we reserving the memory? Because we don't know how to use dynamic memory yet. When we learn how to use dynamic memory, we will modify the source code that we write today. This will be in like a couple lectures. And we'll use, we'll get exactly the size array that we want. So this is an array. Arrays have maximum sizes. We are going to pick a number. Uh, I picked 100. So the maximum set size is 100 for today's lecture. That means we're also going to need to add a requires clause for insert that says, hey, don't call insert if the set is full. Again, in the future, when we learn about dynamic memory, we will remove this requires clause and we'll make the set get bigger. We don't know how to do that yet, so we're just going to say don't do that. <coughs> so here is a good way to tell other programmers about uh, this constant that has to do with the set. We're going to use a static const int member variable. So it helps to read this backwards. Else capacity is an integer that you can't change, and there's only one. So static member variable means there's only one. All instances of the class share this member variable. All right. If you have two sets, does it make sense that they would have separate arrays to store their separate contents? Cool. If you have two sets, does it make sense that they only really need one copy of the size because the size is never going to change, so they might as well share it? That's what I just did. All the sets share this one variable. This is different than static functions. Static functions use the same word, static, but it means something different. Static in C++ is very confusing because it means different things when it's used in different ways. So static functions mean it's visible only inside one file. Static member variables mean all instances of this set class share this one member variable. You'll do this on project three. That's another reason I added this in here, so you can see what this means. This is a C++ thing. 
Oh, no, it's not just C++ thing. There's, there are uh, class variables in Python, which are the same thing. So uh, another way to think of static, it's kind of like a compromise between a global variable and don't do that. All the sets can see this one variable, but outside the set you can't. What would happen if you didn't have static in front of that number variable? What would happen if we omitted this? Uh, then every time you made a set, it would have its own copy of capacity. So every single set you created would be slightly bigger. So this is more efficient, the way I did it. That's the reason I did it, is to make it more efficient. And that's the reason we did that with the card in Euchre. We didn't need every card to keep track of how to spell two. We just needed one copy of how to spell the word two and how to spell the word three. So now let's implement size. Uh, this is the shortest member function. It we already know how big the array is because we, let me rephrase that. We know how big the array is because of capacity. We know how many boxes of the arrays are in use. So this is 0, 1, 2, this is 99. If else size is 0, then that means, I'm gonna, I think of this like a divider. That means they're... We have 100 boxes. We're not using any of them right now. So the size is 0. Am I going too fast? Can I explain anything on here a second time? Is there a reason why you use uh, L size height? So like there's more steps here to actually find the size. Since you have the size of L. How would you do it? So this is, let's say we had an array that had one item in it, and the item that was in it was like, I don't know, 11. Now else size is 1. It's how many elements you should, you should use. Ignore everything else. All right, so now we're going to search the set. We've got three member functions. To do query, we have to search the set looking for a number. To do remove, we have to search for a number, and if it exists, take it out. For insert, we have to search for a number, and if it doesn't exist, add it. Why, why do I have that if it doesn't exist part? Because no duplicates. So these have search in common. Um, this is... This is a good uh, opportunity to write a, uh, an extra member function, like a helper function. So we're going to add a private member function called index of. Notice how this is different than query. Index of tells me where. Query just tells me that it's here. And index of tells me where. So we're going to use a private member function to get this job done. Why wouldn't you label that static? Good question. Because it's a member function. Because it's a member function. If it was in a C style abstract data type and it was a helper function, then we'd use static. The difference between a static member function and a static vanilla function is huge. And we're not going to get into that today. So index of, we're going to walk through the array. I don't know, one, two, three. If we're looking for index of three, then we wait until else of i, so if i is two here, equals v. Then return the index. If it's not found, uh, we're going to use else capacity as a way to tell the other functions that it's not here. Is 
the question was, uh, I'm going to rephrase a little bit. Right now, we, what we have here is set.h, and what we have here is set.cpp. And we'll put the public member functions as well as the private member function implementations in the cpp file. All right, so now that we have index of, writing query is a lot shorter. Um, we can find the index of, so let's say we're looking for the index of three. And that returns two because it's in position two. Are you with me that if it's there, it'll return a number that's smaller than 100? And if it's not there, it'll send, give us else capacity? And so that's how we can tell. Uh, I, I could have written this code out longhand, like if index of v equals blah, 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 return true, else return false. Lots of programmers do it the way I did it on one line. All right. So now we got to write insert. First, we're going to look for the index of to insert. Then if it doesn't exist, then we add it to the end of the array. And then we make else size bigger. Make sense? So let's write this function. I'll give you a minute to read. I'll give you about 60 seconds to read through this source code, and then I'll do an example. All right, let's take a look. Let's do an example with insert four. We're going to start off with a set that has one, two, three in it. So our set here is one, two, three. Query V, what does that give me? Gives me false. So I'm not going to return. All right, done. Now I move on to this line of code. <clears throat> hey, we have a requires clause. Actually, I probably should have. Actually, why did I put my assert on the second line instead of the first line? Pretty, pretty subtle. Like, what if it's full and you want to insert three? Is that okay? Yeah, if it's already in there. No harm. So I got to make sure, otherwise, I got to make sure that the size is less than the capacity. If the size is equal to the capacity, have I used all my boxes? I've used them all, so there's no space for another one. All right, I checked my requires clause. You with me so far? All right, now let's move on to this line of code. <coughs> the only time to use the postfix increment operator is when? 
if you want to be cute. I love being cute. So we're going to use it today. Actually, well, I'll do it with this, and then I'll rewrite it to not use the postfix operator. So what we do first is we get the value of out size, which is currently 3. And so I have 0, 1, 2, 3. And then I assign the value v, which is 4. Put that here. You with me? Do you agree that that went in the correct spot? Then I do this part, and I make it 4. Make sense? This is a really common way to use the plus plus operator. Do you agree that it made a difference that I used postfix instead of prefix? That's when to use it. It was if it actually makes a difference. So let's rewrite this line of code to not use. So let's do that. Let's do that. So we're back where we started. And now we're going to do the insert. What is else size? It's 3. What is v? It's 4. So I go to slot number 3, and I, add, and I put in the new number. Then what do I need to do? On a second line of code, I can do this. There's nothing the plus plus operator can do for you that you can't do on two lines of code. Let me say that. It, let me rephrase that. If you want to, forget about postfix increment and use two lines of code. That's a perfectly acceptable way to carry out the rest of your life. Unless you're a C programmer. If you're a professional C programmer, C programmers love that stuff. OK. What's return doing right here? So let's, let, let's rework this problem. So here we are with the set 1, 2, 3, 4. And now let's work this problem a second time, and then let's do insert 4 again. All right, so now we do this line of code. Query 4, and what does this give us? True. So now we're like, boom, we're out of here. Does that give me the correct answer? Is 4 in the set? So I, yeah, I inserted 4. It works. That's why. And it's a, it's a void return type, so I can just return. More questions? All right. I just need to check where I am. Yep. So now we're going to do remove. Remove is really similar to insert. Uh, I'll just do an example. We're going to start with the same array we had last time. So step one, let's say we want to remove three. No, let's remove two. I like that one. We're going to remove two. So first line of code, we find the index of two. What is the index of two? It is one. So that means the value of victim is one. So now I see if it wasn't found. Can you remove something that was not found? No. So this is what we're checking for. All right. Now we go on to the third line of code. We'll use a couple of colors here. So now we know that the value of victim here is 1. That's this guy. We know we want that one gone. Agreed? So now let's go over here. Um, what's else size? You know, I got to get my colors right, or this will be confusing. 
What was else size before I started this problem? Four, right? So now, should I use the new value? Should I modify else size first, or should I grab the value of else size first? We should modify else size first. Why? Because this is the prefix decrement operator. Prefix means do it first. Do the, do the, do the prefix first. So we're going to take else size and we're going to make it smaller. And then we get this. Questions or can I keep going? OK, so now we're going to take this box right here. We're going to take this box right here. Are you with me that that's box number one and box number three? We're going to go like that. And I'm done. OK, somebody asked me the obvious question. Why didn't you get rid of the last one? It's still there. You are such a liar. Because else size, I thought you would never ask, by the way. Um, let's see, purple's a good one for this. Else size is three, and three says, I only care about this stuff over here. If it's on the other side of the purple line, I don't care what it is. Again, this is how most computers work on the inside. You never actually delete stuff. You just delete the pointer to it and forget about it. Are you with me? This is a lot less work than like trying to rearrange the whole thing. What if you wanted to keep the order of things? What if you didn't want to keep the order of things? Then you would do this. Uh, on Wednesday, we'll care about order. And then we'll change all our algorithms. For now, we're going to not care about order because it's a little easier and faster. The question, so your question was uh, some ideas about keeping it sorted. I'm going to hold off on the ideas of keeping it sorted for Wednesday, and then we can talk about the ideas. All right, now this line of code. Let's talk about this one. We need a constructor to initialize the default value of a set. Please implement this on your own or with a neighbor. The part that's not tricky, I kind of set it right here. Set else size, please. So here we go. Set else size, please. It should be zero. Well, there was, there was another member variable. What was it? The array. 
I'm not setting any values in the array here. Is that a mistake? So are you with me that my array could have some garbage values in it? Forty two is not garbage, thank you. Uh, so else size zero says please ignore the stuff on the right. The set is everything on the left. There's zero things on the left. Will this make our set any less correct? No. Will it make our set faster the way I did it? Yes, because it takes time to visit every element in an array. 100 elements, that's not that big for a computer. What if our array is like a million? Sorry, what if our set has a million max size? Then it would, you know. How about 10 million? It's still like one second. For 10 million? To allocate all that memory? Why don't you benchmark it for me? No, I'm kidding. Uh, are, are you with me that we could, we, could, we, could, we could someday need a set that was big enough that this would start being a problem? That's the point I'm trying to make. And as computers get faster, how big that number is grows. Yes? What's the colon on that second uh, The colon means I'm about to use an initializer list. The initializer list goes before the implementation starts. This would be the same thing as This would be the same thing. If you use an initializer list, but you also have like stuff in the actual function definition, what runs first? So the question was, what if we had this? Mm -hmm. Does it set zero, or does it say hello first? Yeah. It sets zero first, okay. always. Very helpful to know. All right. Um, I'm just going to show you this print member function because I want to make sure we have enough time today. And I think we need a, we're going to need a break today, too. So here's our print member function. It's const, meaning it promises not to modify anything in the array. And it promises not to modify else size. It won't modify anything. And it visits each item in the array and prints it. OK. Let's take a break. Five minutes.
All right, let's get started again. Let's get started again. Now we can use our set. It's, uh, it, we finished coding it. So we can create a zero size set like this. And then we can add a couple of things to the set. Notice that this is a duplicate. But then when I print, there's no duplicates. So that means uh, we did the right thing with our insert function and we avoid any duplicates. We can take stuff out. So when I take seven out, it's gone. And I'm making no effort to sort in today's entire lecture. So from the outside, uh, our class is a simple to use set. From the inside, that's where we worried about all the implementation details of using an array and using a cert to make sure that we didn't break the requires clause and stuff. Questions about the set from the outside programmer's perspective? All right. So now we got uh, a limitation on our set. Um, what if we want to use a set of strings? Sets of strings are very useful for keeping track of the names of your chickens. You know, like the, my, the first chickens I ever had were Myrtle. May she rest in peace. <laughs> she was, so she was, a, a, when she was a Polt, Polt is like the word for teenage chicken. She was, that's like a couple months old. Uh, she fell asleep at night against the fence instead of going into the house. She was like sleeping against the fence. And in the morning, all that was left was a bunch of feathers and a liver on a stick. A, we think it was like a weasel, or maybe a raccoon, dismembered Myrtle, <laughs> pulled her through the hole in the fence, and ate everything except for the liver. Yeah, it was. It was gory. So then I got another chicken named Myrtle the second. <laughs> named in her honor. What's that? <laughs> I, I didn't hear you. Both Myrtles laid green eggs. It's true. There are some chickens that lay green eggs. There's a breed of chicken called Aracana, and this kind of chicken lays green eggs. And I, this, I don't have any chickens that lay green eggs right now. I'm getting all brown eggs. Uh, but I'm a little sad without my green eggs because they just, they're so much more fun. So I, I think this spring I got to get some baby chickens that lay green eggs. Would you also have some green ham with that? Would you also have some green ham with that? Uh, maybe some green beer? St. Patrick's Day? No. All right, so what if we want to put a different type in the set? Let's start with a bad idea. Let's copy paste the entire code base that we just created. And then we're just going to change everywhere it says int, we're going to change it to string. Do you agree that this would get the right answer? Yes. Why is this a bad idea? We'd have to make a new set for every different object. That's one reason. What's another reason why it's a bad idea? I know copy paste is bad, but like I'm trying to get you to think about why is copy paste bad. Well, now you'd have two classes with the same name. Now we'd have two classes with the same name. Uh, you have a good point. <laughs> <laughs> if we want to change something about one step, we have to go copy paste our changes again. What if we made a mistake and like maybe we had a bug in the insert function? Then we'd have to change all the insert functions, not just one. Uh, so. There was this missile defense system in the 90s that was deployed in the Persian Gulf. And this missile system had a computer in it that was supposed to detect another missile and then calculate when the missiles were coming in and then shoot another missile to like destroy the other missile. So it was like missile on missile warfare. The timing had to be just right to get one really fast missile to run into another really fast missile and explode the other missile. So they used computers to do it. Makes sense. 
the source code for the missiles was written in C. And the person who wrote the source code had not taken X280 with Professor DiOrio. <laughs> they had some source code that changed the format of the time. So I, I don't remember if, exactly if it's what I'm about to say, but it was something close to it's either a double or is it a float. Those are both fractions, but one's more accurate than the other. Double's more accurate, exactly. So they, they had stored the time in several different uh, formats, and they realized this was a mistake, and they fixed it. But they'd copy-pasted the code in several places, and they didn't fix the places where they copy-pasted it. So actual real missile comes in. They deploy the anti-missile, and it misses because it got the time wrong. And a bunch of people died. So that's what happens when you copy-paste code. So let me show you uh, one, more, uh, one more strategy you can use for avoiding copy-paste. Uh, the, the computer science term for it is generic programming. Uh, the general idea is write an algorithm and specify the type later. We use templates in C++ to do generic programming. So now what we're going to do uh, is we're going to turn our class into a set. We've, we've used templates before. Like in project one, when we used a vector and we did this, that says, hey, I want a vector, and I want it to hold doubles. Does it make sense that our set could hold doubles or ints or strings, and we could do the same thing that vector does? So let's do it. Before I do it, can I answer any questions about uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do? Could a set hold sets? Absolutely. In project one, did you have a vector that held vectors? Yeah, we didn't know if it was project. Sure thing. You can have a vector of a vectors. You could have a. In project one, you used a vector of a vector. We're going to write source code to hold anything inside a set, including sets. So the question was, um, in a set, I'm going to go back. In a set, we need to do things like, comp oh no, that's a bad example. Way at the beginning. In a set, we need to do things like, check if the item is in the set. How do we check if the item is in the set? We use the equal equal operator. What if you put a chicken or something in here that doesn't have an equal equal operator? Then it won't compile. So it will, it will do something sane. And not compile is a very sane thing to do if, uh, if, if in the future the program would be unable to do its member functions. So let's get back to our templates. Here is template notation. Before the class, we're going to write this. Uh, T, you get to choose this. T is pretty common. Um, value type is sometimes used. So T is the type. T is like int. T is like string. T is like double. So now what we can do is we can use t instead of int. So before we meant, it, please insert this int named v. Now we say, please insert this t named v. I'll tell you what t is later. Please remove this t named v. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what type t is later. Same thing for query. Um, I want an array of t's. I'll tell you what t is later. int t. That's a great point. Like that. Let me write that down. If 
If only Microsoft PowerPoint had a compiler. <laughs> so uh, why don't I need to change this int into a T? So no matter what type I want to put in my set, size is always going to be an int. And that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So template member functions. I, I, I'm done with the class declaration. Now let's move on to the member function definitions. So I'm done with my prototypes. Now let's move on to my implementations. Every single member function implementation, we got to add this, and we also have to add this. So the new parts are in red. This tells the compiler which version of set my member function goes with. So what's really going on under the hood is the we're getting the compiler to do that co big copy-paste job for us. That's what's really going on here. So are we writing that literally into the source code, or are we replacing T with the particular type name? So we are writing what's on my slide literally. And we're using capital T. Capital T means, hey, compiler, in the future, when you're doing the compiling, I know that t is going to turn into int, and here's where I want it to turn into int, or string, or something else. So again, t is a short, t is like a variable. It's like a variable for a type. Yeah? What's that keyword type name? What's that keyword type name? It's a keyword called type name. I don't know how else to say it. That was going to be my answer, actually. <laughs> So uh, it's built into C++. And it's like saying, hey, compiler, this isn't a variable. It's the name of a type. Type name. Do you need this in the .h file? All right, so where, do the, where does this stuff go? Step one, it goes in the .h file right next door to the class. Step number two, we're in the .cpp file, and this goes next door to each member function implementation. So it helps to know how to copy-paste things in your text editor just for this line of code. When you get good at your text editor, there's features to be like, grab this whole line and then give me it back later. So you don't have to do all that whole like, like the mouse. Ugh. <laughs> you got to like move your hand away from the home row and it's just like, oh, takes so long. And you got to like move your wrist around and it's terrible. Yes. Is this similar to overloading? The last slide in the lecture touches on this idea. We're, we're, we're doing something that's kind of like polymorphism here. There's more than one set, and they have a lot in common, but they, they deal with different types. We, don't need to write the function again. we do not need to write the function again. Would you ever want to use template or type name apart from the other word? Would you ever want to use template or type name apart from the other word? Uh, I can't think of an example off the top of my head. But you'll be the first person I call if I do. So before we had set query int, after we added this, we added this, and we added this. I, I think the before and the after is the most helpful thing to, uh, to understand the difference.
So the question was, what if you're implementing a whole bunch of member functions? Like we had query, we had index, we had remove, blah, 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 blah. Do we have to keep copy pasting this thing? Or is there an easier way to do it? You have to keep copy pasting this thing. Why? Because this is now part of the prototype of the function. That's why. This is part of the function prototype now. It's just more convenient to put it on two lines. But it's part of the function prototype. What if you forgot this? You would get lots of confusing compiler errors about like, I don't know what a T is. You know when the compiler like gets that whiny, panicky voice on and you're like, compiler, my project is due tonight. Don't do this to me right now. Please be reasonable. That's why, did you see when I was coding, I was always making sure that it compiled? I'd put like garbage code in there, like print statements or return true or something, and then make sure it compiles. I only write little bits of code before I make sure it compiles. Writing lots of code and then saying, all right, step two, compile. Step one, do project. Step two, compile. <laughs> uh, that, that's a really frustrating way to do your project. All right, now we can use our templated set. This is the same example I did before in red. I added this part. Doesn't that look a lot like the syntax you used on project one with vector? Yep, it's the same thing. This is how vector is coded under the hood. Now you know how vector works. Through and through. Member functions, the brackets, everything. This means that I can additionally make sets of other types, like strings. So now my set of chickens works correctly. And I can write one program that uses one set, and it has, and I use it twice, once for ints and once for chickens, or for strings. It would work for chickens, too, if I had a custom type called class chicken. Then I could use my set with that as well, as long as I overloaded the equal equal operator to test if the chicken was the same chicken or not. So the question was, what if you wanted to make a member function that like, really only worked with ints? And then you tried to use it with a string. Don't do that. <laughs> like, like division. Here's a good example, like division. Division works with ints. It doesn't work with strings. What if a set somehow used a division in there? Then your template would have to say, only do this with stuff that, with types that implement the division operator. It'd be like an extra requires clause for the template. The question was, could you do like one thing if it's an int and another thing if it's a string? It depends on your input. Uh, there's this thing called template specialization, but it's not even something we teach at the University of Michigan. <laughs> so there, there are some ways to do specialized things with types. The general rule is, if you want to do one thing for one type and another thing for another type, maybe you should just make two classes. That would probably be less confusing to the other programmer. One more, and then I'll keep going. If we did make two classes like that, is there any way to inherit all this wonderful set stuff from types? No. <laughs> all right. So let me. Let's get inside the head of the compiler when the compiler is reading code that uses templates. This will help us understand better the kinds of errors we'll get in the future. So every time a compiler sees a different T, it copies and pastes the whole class and substitutes the type like int for T. So on this line of code, the compiler says, ah, a set, I know what to do with that. But this is the first time I've seen a set. So I will copy paste the entire source code for set in my memory, because I'm the compiler and I'm perfect. And I'm going to replace every capital T with int. This is basically what the compiler is doing under the hood. And then it works. So then we go on to this line of code. And the compiler says, ah, set again. I know what to do with that. But I've never seen a set of string before in this program. So I will copy paste the entire source code for set. I will replace t with string, and then we'll keep going. 
So then the compiler gets to this line of code and says, ah, a set of int. I've done this before. And it reuses number one. This is really getting the compiler to copy paste for you. If you think of it that way in your head, uh, it will help you understand the kinds of compiler errors they get, that you get. Is writing a compiler the hardest thing you can do ever? No. But it is pretty hard. And uh, so the source code for G++, they made their own language for it. There are like whole conferences with big classes just teaching you how to modify G++. So nobody does that. They use Clang when they want to modify a compiler. Because it's somebody rewrote it and was like, OK, how can we make this easier to modify? Clang is the compiler that Apple OS X uses under the hood. And it's also used in lots of other places. Compilers are pretty complicated pieces of software, though. I think something that helps you a lot with understanding C++ is to get two mental models. The most important mental model is memory. And like, what is the hardware going to do when the hardware sees my program? And the other mental model is, how does the compiler see my program? So what is the compiler going to do when it sees this C++ source code? If you get those mental models, you can more quickly write code that's, that works. And you can understand what's going wrong better than the people who didn't go to the University of Michigan. There's lots of people that start with programming languages that are higher level, like Java or Python. And they never get down to C and C++, so they never have to do more difficult things like this. And so they don't have this mental model of, what is the computer really doing? And so there are some problems that they just cannot debug. Because if it involves a pointer and it dumps an address, they're just like, hire somebody else. <laughs> and that's where you come in. So template code always goes in the .h file. To change t to int, the compiler needs to change member function prototypes. We already saw that, like changing t's to ints. But the compiler might also need to change a function body. Like what if we had an example function that created a temporary variable of type t? This is a totally legit thing to do for a member function. And the compiler needs to swap out the t's for ints. And it needs to know what those types are. That's why it has to go in the header file. So that means we need to put the declaration, that's the prototypes, and the definitions all in set.h. Oh man, what if we accidentally pound include set.h a couple times, and now all of our code is in there? So here, uh, graph.h includes, so we use a set in main, so we include set.h. And then we use a graph in main, so we include graph.h. But graph.h over here includes set.h. And so remember, pound include is basically a giant copy-paste that the compiler does for you. The compiler does lots of copy-pasting for you. Does, can you see the logic here that set.h gets pound included twice in this program? And so we get this redefinition error. This is why you see this in the sample code that the staff gives you. This is why. This tells the compiler, hey, compiler, if you've, seen, if you've never seen set before, go on and read this. If you've already seen set before, then just skip. If you've already seen set before, then just skip. Uh, if you're using G++, um, I think OS X will also do this. Many compilers implement pragma once, which is a shortcut. But this is in the ONC C++ standard. All right, so to wrap it up, I got like two, maybe three more slides. Yeah, we're getting really close here. So stick with me here. I'll give two conclusions. So one is these containers are still homogenous. We can change the type, but one container holds all integers, and another container holds all strings. So we still can't mix the two types in one container. That hasn't changed. The other thing is an insight about polymorphism. This is one of the most interesting insights of the whole lecture. We learned about polymorphism last time that happened at runtime. This is another example of polymorphism that happens at compile time. 
So here, polymorphism is different behavior for different types. Here, the different behaviors are really similar, but it operates on different types. So we can get the compiler to have different member functions for different types using templates, and we can get the runtime environment to have different member functions for different types using inheritance. So these are two different places that polymorphism shows up in C++. Once that's static, that's today's lecture, and once that's dynamic, that was last time's lecture. So static polymorphism, templates. Dynamic polymorphism, derived types. That's what I got for today. So I will see you on Wednesday.